You know, whenever I'm out on a long training run or an ultra event, there's three things that keep me going. My music, my thoughts, and my sword endurance strength. That's right. Sword endurance strength has everything your body needs to keep it going all day long. So head on over to drinksword.com and enter code HEARTLANDRUNNER at checkout for 20% off your purchase. All right, everybody, on to the show. Welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. Join Crystal, Andy, and Stephen as they explore all things running related in the Heartland and beyond. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. I'm Crystal. And I'm Stephen. And we are your grass fed, handcrafted, mouth watering, artisan, non GMO, gluten free, organic hosts. Now you're just showing off. <laughs> How am I? How am I supposed to top that one? I don't know. That's what happened. You left me in charge tonight. You, you, you just, you, you just, you just destroyed the intro. I have to start <laughs> all over again. <sighs> Boy, you give him. We the- are missing Andy tonight um, because he is off. His all-star son is playing baseball, so he is catching that game. So we're wishing him all the best and hoping for a win tonight. Dang right, but he'll be with, back with us on our next episode. Well, yes. who do we have tonight, Crystal? We have a true to life comic book superhero. And so let me let me tell you a little bit about it. And I'll, so I'm going to tell you the story. And this is all true because I read it on the Internet. Oh, and so that's it's how, true. That's how yes. I know it's true. OK, so it starts off. We, we have a hero kind of growing up, just real average kid, average teenager, um, you know, good protagonist has, you know, personal challenges, goes through a lot of stuff. Then I believe it was about the age of 15. He was bitten by a radioactive runner. Really? Yeah, totally true. So we got Spider Runner on tonight. Yeah, chomped. And so what happened is he develops superpowers. But he takes years to develop these superpowers. And they develop over time. And then he starts getting so good, he has to come up with a secret identity so nobody finds him out. So kind of like, you know, Peter Parker, Bruce Wayne. So he decides to become a public school teacher. Oh, yeah. And, and and what's the alias name? And so he goes by Harvey Lewis. Oh, come on. <laughs> that one's too easy. I'd know right away that was a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all true. Right, Harvey? You guys are killing me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I hope there's not that many people going to tune into this. <laughs> can't get to tell the whole world, you know? <laughs> Blew what, your cover. I'm sorry. Just put some glasses on. No one will know the difference. <laughs> Oh, you guys are great. Thank you both so much, Stephen, Crystal. I uh, love being on the show with you both, and uh, it's great to hear your enthusiasm. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on this evening. Well, thank you for coming on. I've uh, I've been reading your, your bio that uh, Crystal put together, and I'm just, we don't like to cuss a lot on this show, but I was just reading it and just had to think, damn. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have done some amazing uh, things. You guys are too kind, truly. Thank you. You know, it, it's really our sport is is a, a really special sport, and it's still, you know, it's not, uh, it's still a little bit in the in the shadows in American culture. You know, so it, it's a really be a really exciting to be a part of the sport, and uh, we have such amazing people in uh, our community of runners. So, you know, I get so much positive energy from them, and. Yeah, you know, it's really just been a just a uh, something. It's materializing the more I could ever dream when I first got into this. How did you first get into running? Well, you know, it, it was mainly running after the the uh, the ice cream truck you know, on my street. <laughs> that 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 pretty much started off. But my sister came home one time. She uh, had had done a little track, and she said, "Oh, she wanted me to go out and run run with her." And I think we made it. We you know, we may have made it around the block, which was a small block at that time, <laughs> and uh, I thought I was gonna die. But uh, I got into a little further uh, in middle school. I, I, I started to run uh, with the football team when we had to do our training, and that 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 was kind of the start of it because I wasn't very good in football, but I could like keep going on the laps even though I I, I was really really not a football player. So. That got me more interested, and then eighth grade, I ran track, and ninth grade, I ran track again, and throughout that time of running in high school and middle school, I, I was really a back-of-the-pack runner, but I enjoyed it. 
And on a whim, I, I jumped into the Cleveland Marathon at age 15. And I uh, just I had seen it on TV. They used to televise it. And it would interrupt like the Saturday morning cartoons and make me a little frustrated. Oh, that made me uh, mad. But then I started, oh, yeah. But then I, I just got really intrigued watching these runners working so hard and uh, pushing these barriers that I thought seemed inconceivable to be running 26 miles. So that, that really got me interested in it. And that, that, that was the start. But go, go, go. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, ju- just to read off some of your minor accomplishments, you are the uh, winner by over 15 minutes at Badwater 135 in 2014. You've represented Team USA at the 24-hour World Championships three times and has made the team for a fourth year. So you're headed to Belfast. And you set the course yes, record. Yes, I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and you set the course yeah. record at North Coast 24 in 2015, 100 and okay, you're get you're getting a little anal here, Crystal. 157.9081 <laughs> miles. <laughs> but you know what? After that long, every single inch counts. That's true. That's say. true. Oh my god, that's the truth. There, there's you know, a joke there someplace. I could never too, have but... imagined. <laughs> Definitely. So oh. is, is that uh, is that course record? Is it still holding? Or yes, it is. In fact, uh, it, my teammates uh, won this year, but the course record has hasn't been uh, surpassed yet. So it still stands, and and I'm hoping to go back. Well, I'm definitely going to be going back this fall for the national championship. We'll have that in September, and I, I hope to break the the record on the course again. So you going for nine zero eight two? Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Still counts. You never know. You never know. You never know. Oh boy! But yeah, and you're not a, I guess what people would call a professional runner, are you? No, I'm not. I'm not a professional runner. It's it's kind of a you know it's, it's been something that I'm a passionate runner. So I'm not not a professional runner. Uh, basically, I, I'm a teacher, so I, I teach uh, teach by day, and running is just a, one of my my great passions I have. And so, usually around, I'm all uh, training all over, all all different times. In fact, now it's even at lunchtime. So, <laughs> oh, what? now what is it? That morning, you teach? morning, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> what I is teach it? Th- uh, AP AP government, and I teach uh, government financial literacy. Okay, your your students must love you. Well, yeah, I have some really amazing students at the School for Performing Arts, and uh, there are there are a few that get driven nuts by me, <laughs> but because I I will push them too. But all in all, uh, yeah, we have a very good relationship. No, I, he's being modest. I can tell you, his students love him, and just from what I can see through kind of some of the social media stuff and just the stuff that he does um, with his students is really cool. Um, a couple weekends ago, we just had the Flying Pig here in Cincinnati, which is our big hometown race. And um, Harvey's a streaker of that. He's done all 19 consecutive. And he was shooting for a PR this weekend. And what's really cool, this is the kind of guy that Harvey is, he's shooting for a PR. He lets everybody know that he's going for it. Now, see, when you go for a PR on a marathon, tell me what, it, and the race is on Sunday, what do you typically do on Friday and Saturday? What would you be your typical weekend leading up to a big, important PR race? Well, I do everything wrong. Um, <laughs> so I, I would eat like McDonald's. Um, I would probably have three or four <laughs> beers the night before. Um, I would definitely decide to try something new uh, for the marathon just because, you know, I like to, I like to challenge everything. So uh, I'm not a good person to ask. So you're not a good See, now <laughs> no. if I was going to announce a lot, my PRs are well behind me, but I'll tell you, I don't. I, I'm not very social. I may, you know, scoot through the expo. I'm sitting around. I'm not talking to anybody. Harvey's out there with everybody <laughs> and his students. They were doing the, it was a mile, wasn't it? The the 26th mile. And then I, this was our first year having a group of students that did the half marathon. So oh, it was the, we were oh, it was super the half. excited. Yeah. 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 So we had, this is, we, we've had a running club at SCPA for about six years. And we've always done the 5K race. And it's kind of like a, a little endeavor I volunteer with. It's not like a, a schedule uh, But 
And so I've typically in the past just run with the kids twice a week. But this year we really stepped it up and we started earlier. We started in February 1st and we trained every day of the week. So it was, uh, it was really amazing to watch the kids develop and to see like just how excited they were once they finished a half marathon. I mean, and there, every single kid finished and every single kid said, we're, we're going again next year. In fact, a few of them want to do the marathon. So, uh, oh, we're, awesome. we're really, really, really excited. And there's a really amazing program they have out in LA where they, they get the kids prepared for the marathon. And it's the only race I'm familiar with that does that. I, I typically pace the LA marathon with Cliff Bar and, uh, it just blows my mind. I love seeing the kids. There's a lot of skepticism out there about, you know, starting kids too young and, and this and that. And they're, what they've done is they've set up a, a criterion list of things that the kids must reach as prerequisites before they do the race so that they're actually prepared. And, you know, for myself, I started at 15 running marathons, <laughs> albeit not very, you know, it took me about five years to break the five, five hour barrier in the marathon, but uh, I've always been healthy. Like I'm, I'm healthy today. I have no injuries. Uh, you know, the things that would, would cause skepticism amongst people. Uh, you know, if, if you train properly, you can, you can run for your whole lifetime, you know? So it's, uh, it's something that's really positive for these kids. Uh, you know, I think even like amongst our students, I think we have, I see a, a, a lesser number of students are like even like, interested in like smoking or like drugs uh, at our school because of, like the, the passion for the arts and there's like positive outlets. And I kind of look at this as just one additional positive outlet for kids. So it's been uh, amazing to see them through this. Oh, that that's great. So we've actually uh, talked about this on some early episodes. Uh, actually, I think it was the other podcast that I think about it. So you don't have a problem. Yeah. You don't have a problem with teenagers running half marathons or marathons. No, I, I don't. Uh, there, there are certain criteria that they have to they have to meet. Like for instance, you know, you wouldn't just necessarily now. In my first marathon, I actually the furthest I'd ever run was eight miles, and then I just jumped into the race. I'm like, saying this Ohio thing. Eight, 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 eight <laughs> days. You know, so I wouldn't suggest that. You know, it, it would be advisable to like train, you know, have, they have to have a long run in their stretch it, it, of training. They have to meet other criteria. Uh, you know, of course we have physicals for all the kids. They have to go through their doctors. Uh, you know, so there's, 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 it's not just, you know, throwing kids out there. Right. And, I, and I do have my skepticism about younger kids than, than, than a certain age. I, I think that there's a lot of activities kids can get involved with, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100% sold on, on some of the young ages I hear kids doing, you know, ultra, ultra distances. Um, but if it's something that's self-motivated, it's not like something that the, the parents are, you know, overly pushing on the kid, it, it, it's possible. So I just have to look at each case at a case by case basis. Yeah. And I think that's the, the smart way to do it. Uh, everybody's a little different. Yeah. Right. Right. I, I see here that, uh, you had a little weight problem as a kid. Did, did were you able to solve that yes, through running or? Yes, you know I, I did actually. I was when I was really young. I I lived in some beautiful areas of the world. I, I lived in uh, the uh, Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania uh, up to about age five in a place called Chalk Hill, <laughs> and that was an extraordinary place to live. And when I lived there, I was always doing something active outdoors. And when I moved to uh, Berea uh, in like first grade, uh, and then I or second grade, and I lived there throughout my like uh, childhood up until graduating high school. I got into playing video games <laughs> probably as passionately as I ran ultras. <laughs> I run ultras today. I was I was serious on that. I even got like some uh, slack at one point for being one of the first. Uh, people that beat the Legend of Zelda. <laughs> so, I, I now was, that's an accomplishment. I was, that I was, be up I was here. ornery. Oh, I, I know. I, I was ornery. I would like. Uh, I would be so bad. I would find a way to, to stay home from school so I could play video games whenever possible. <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know that that was that was the thing. By eight, 
I ate pretty poorly. I mean, it wasn't my, it, it was just a cultural thing. You know, my, my mother had been conditioned eating a certain way and yeah, uh, it, we just, we ate a lot of uh, fast food and we ate uh, really heavily on the meat portions and we just uh, ate a lot of like unhealthy uh, types of foods in my, it, so that, that was just, and then I just didn't, I did love to get out and play f- like football on the street and other things, but I was the second biggest kid in my school, believe it or not, up until when I started running in, uh, in, in uh, middle school in eighth grade and in uh, high school. And I lost uh, that weight. Yeah. But so running definitely influenced my, my weight for sure. And just a lifestyle too. And you've, you're vegetarian now though, correct? You've been for years. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's very important for me. i I've been vegetarian uh, for 21 years now and actually fully vegan uh, since January. And I love eating vegan so much, so much. I cannot believe how much I love it uh, because I thought it was going to be a lot harder than it is. And I find like eating vegan, I eat so much even more healthy than I did as vegetarian because I'm not eating pizza as much and other things. I would just, they were available. So I would just eat it all. You know, (laughs) now I like, I actually seek out like eating really good sources of food and I'm a little bit more mindful of like, uh, the, the nutrition, the nutrition, just because I've been like, you know, uh, transitioning. I just want to make sure that I, that I eat like really well. And, uh, it doesn't mean you can't have beer. It doesn't mean you can't have Coca-Cola or desserts and all kinds of other things. There, there's all kinds of options out there. Uh, but that I made a big, when I started eating vegetarian, I made a big jump in my running. And that was another jump that, that pushed me forward. I just noticed an, an immediate impact in my energy level and my ability to, uh, rebound. So, I mean, there's some other people out there like Michael Wardian. He's another, yep. uh, he's primarily vegan and he's another one that like people are like just, really impressed how he rebounds so, so rapidly, you know, in my, my fiance, Kelly, she, she coaches uh track and she was telling the kids this last weekend, a couple boys that asked like, is Harvey vegetarian? She's like, yeah. And she, they're like, well, how does he get his protein? You know, it's like it, our culture, we, we get all this inundation about marketing that, you know, you have to eat the protein from an animal source or you have to get this in order to, to be healthy. And, uh, in fact, in, in many cases, it's just the opposite of that. You could actually, uh, if you talk to most cardiologists, they'll tell you the healthiest, uh, you could be is actually eating a, a more plant-based options. It's, it's phenomenal. And, and I'm noticing a major energy, you know, difference, even eating vegan now. Now, let me, let me ask you a question because I have, okay, I, I, I enjoy, uh, charred mammal flesh. Um, <laughs> but I, I have always thought about doing a vegetarian, experiment for a year right right so i guess what i'm looking for is what advice do you have for someone that might want to try a vegetarian diet because i don't know if i could just give up my burgers and steak cold turkey (laughs) yes you know i I always suggest to people that they don't need to like become all the way vegetarian or all the way vegan uh just you know eating more meals that have vegetarian and uh, options Mm-hmm. can be really excellent for you. So you don't necessarily have to do it overnight. Uh, but the other thing I find is, for me, when I did it first, is I, I initially, I still kept eating fish. I did that for like a, a few, a couple months. And now I was like, wow, I feel so much better just as this. I'm just going to keep on going with this. And so I think uh, having like uh, a transition, or you might also say, okay, like when I started the vegan thing in January, my, it was one of my New Year's goals. I wanted to eat more vegan. So my idea was I was going to eat vegan six days a week and one day have the option to just eat whatever, you know, vegetarian option I wanted to. And I pretty much put that in there just because if I'm at like, uh, you know, a friend's house or, or out to eat, I don't want to like put any inconvenience on anybody else. But once I started with the vegan, uh, eating like that, I, I just really loved it. So I decided, oh, I'm right from the, get go i was going to just do it all the time so i would suggest really more uh sorry about that i can't help myself but to go for a uh, walk <laughs> when i'm uh, i'm always like training 
So I mean, <laughs> training never stops. Okay, sorry about that. Well, that's okay. How many yeah, more so days I, till I, Belfast? We have 46 days of Belfast and 54 days of bad water. Well, see, you got to keep moving because Belfast, you're representing us all there. So that's a lot of pressure. Right. That's Team USA there. <laughs> yes, it's going to be the Team USA. Uh, we have six men and six women, and they take the top three men and the top three women collectively, and they add those together, and that, that you put against all the teams, and the team with the highest distance wins the overall. They have gold, silver, and medal, uh, bronze medals, and then you could also win an individual gold, silver, or bronze by placing in the podium. Oh, it's a real honor to be on the American team. I mean, honestly, it's pretty neat. Uh, you know, with ultra running, we don't have an Olympic uh, stage yet, which we would love to have. And it may not happen, you know, while I'm at my competitive peak. Uh, but it would be lovely to have, you know, someone else out there doing an ultra in the Olympics. But since we don't have the Olympic forum, we have the world championship. And that's, you know, the, the highest of the sport. So to compete at, you know, the world championship level is, is a really, you know, special experience. And I always love events where I have a team also. So, like, when I go to Badwater, I have a team. Or I've done uh, the Marathon de Sables and had a team. And I, I just really get uh, impassioned by having that team element and collaborating. Because so often we think about running as being an individual sport. But, but it's really special to have that team component where you are out there and you can, you know, kind of push each other, communicate with one another. You're, you're, you're telling your partners, you know, hey, you're doing it. Keep it going. You, you're sending them information. You, uh, you, you just have that whole checks and balances with pacing, all kinds of elements to consider. But you, you, I love it. I love having the team component. And uh, certainly, you know, representing uh, USA is, is, a, is a true, you know, pleasure of the whole experience as well. So, so what, are, what, what are some maybe training tips you can give the listeners? I mean, I don't... Most of us aren't going to be doing uh, 160 miles in 24 hours. I think we're just trying to survive 24 hours of running. <laughs> but uh, yes, what, no, no. I was just wondering if you had any uh, just tips. I mean, you said you walk everywhere, and, and that's something I do too. I, I walk everywhere I possibly can. Absolutely. You know, first off, congratulations to anyone out there that's crazy enough to run an ultra. That's phenomenal. Like, you do it. Go for it. Uh, you know, it's exciting. So congratulations. Uh, with, with, the, with, with the training, I suggest uh, be creative. Like and creativity is one of the biggest assets I find. And, uh, you know, it might be like hey, where are you going to fit your training in? Because you hear it all the time. Uh, people say, well, I don't have any time for that. But you just have to make time for it. Uh, and that's easy to say. True. Uh, easier said than done. But, uh, you know, even at lunchtime, I will get out. You know, like right now, I've started you know, ramping up my training uh, to the highest it's ever been. So I'm like, where can I find time? <laughs> so even at lunchtime, I, I like throw on shoes. I may even be wearing my dress dress pants. And I just go run for a few, mi- a few miles. <laughs> Come on back. You know, the security staff thinks I'm crazy, but they already thought I was crazy. So no problem. <laughs> the kids just think, Mr. Lewis, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, that, that you know, in terms of like, uh, suggestions I, I would say uh you know doing what they're doing now listening and and re- reading and, and researching is, is phenomenal uh f- finding uh pacing is so important and with with that that's any type of race uh it, it's better it's really good to try to have an even race from the first half to the second half and that's something it's taken me a long time to to really try to work to towards perfecting but the more even you have between your, your second half of your race, first half of the race, the faster your possible performance can be. And so that, that's one big thing. And of course, find things that you find the fun in it. Cause if, if it's fun, you're going to want to keep doing it. And your hope is that you're going to want to do this for your whole lifetime. Get stuck in it. <laughs> so we got to see you out there. That's right. I know you like to run. Um, everywhere. And I've even seen, I, is it Kelly's family? I think you mentioned Kelly, your fiance who lives, um, about a hundred miles North of here of Cincinnati. Is that correct? Oh yeah. 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 And so I remember there was yeah. one weekend that you guys were going up to visit her family and I believe she drove up while you ran the hundred miles up. 
<laughs> well, actually, my my honey, she she actually lives in the country home. So I actually, uh, I I typically uh, live there in the weekends, and then I live in the city on the weekdays. Uh, so uh, basically, I I. I normally run commute. Well, actually, I don't normally. I, I basically every day of the year in my city, uh, I run uh, to and from work, and I'll make it. Uh, this will be four years I've been doing that every day uh, at the end of this uh, school year. And uh, basically, last year I just had this idea. I was like, "Well, it'd be kind of fun to you run up to Circleville uh, versus driving on the last day of school." You know, just so I know I can run commute to the country home too. <laughs> if I had to, <laughs> or just for the fun of it, you know. So, so yeah, yeah. She's like, "What are you doing, honey?" Yeah, she thought it was kind of a little crazy idea too. But uh, it was interesting, you know. Going to you're out in the middle of nowhere in Ohio, you find a lot of interesting things that you wouldn't normally see if you're just driving on the highway. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one one particular area was uh, there was no. Uh, I, I brought everything I had and needed in my backpack, like I was self supported. So I would rely on gas stations for like Gatorade or Coca-Cola or whatever I wanted to drink. And uh, there was an area in Ohio where you don't find any gas stations for maybe like 20 miles on the route that I was. Uh, and it was around midnight. So the only place you could go is in one of these country bars. <laughs> and uh, there was like this country band playing and, and everyone was really interested to see me walk in with my running shorts on, my running outfit, my my Newton running shoes, like, what in the world is this man doing? <laughs> they come up to the bar and order, like, Coca-Cola and, like, get about five refills on it. That, that was uh, it was a priceless moment. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. Uh, but, yeah, I, I haven't uh, – I've been kind of toying with the idea of doing it again this year, which would be next week. So I think I probably will run to Circle Vote as long as uh, it's not like a lightning storm in the forecast. Uh, but I was kind of debating about going up and running a hundred mile race in Ontario too, but, uh, it's between those two. <laughs> now, we'll now, see. now, Crystal and I have been like for the last year going, all right, we got to start getting ready for the 100 at Tunnel Hill. <laughs> and here you're like, eh, I think I'll, maybe I'll run a hundred next weekend up to my girlfriend's. <laughs> I don't know, but getting we'll into a bar along the way sounds like a lot more fun. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I should have got a little stronger drink, add a little rum to it, huh? Yeah, yeah. that's for sure. And, and Maybe we, this year. And we can't give Crystal booze. We know she makes bad choices. Yeah, that, that's, that's oh, oh. That's what got her there into running. Go. <laughs> See, but now, now <laughs> Kelly, was, Kelly was thinking you're all insane for doing that, but she knew well ahead of time because you also have one of the um, coolest engagement stories, too, that we got to witness um tell us about that oh yeah that, that was a really special moment in our lives uh right I, kelly has just been a real blessing to my life and i absolutely love her and uh she brings so much like positive joy to my life and so uh i we pretty much knew we and know uh that we want to spend the rest of our lives together after you know a very uh short time in our relationship but uh it was uh that the two, two, let's see, it was about uh, maybe a year and a half into our relationship. We, she came out to Badwater, and she surprised me. I did not know her. she was coming out to the race. And, I, and so my, it, it was just a, amazing like to, to have her out there in the desert. And it was my toughest Badwater in terms of like just having a crash. Like I ran that race really hard in the first 50 miles because the year previously I had won the race. So I wanted to go out and get the record, and I just went too hard and began to race. So I, I was dying out there, and she comes, and it's like a magical to see her on the second mountain, which is about two thirds of the way through the race. So that was wonderful, and she was out there. Uh, I I kept going on with my team. I made it about another uh, twenty or so miles, and I just had to we call it stake out where you can put your stake in the ground, you can go uh, recover in the hotel, and then come back and finish the race if you decide to. And a lot of people, they just stake out and then they, they DNF. Um, but I, I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> and uh, But it, it hit me uh, somewhere along the line there. I was like, well, you know, I, I, I just want to like uh, get engaged. So we were out there in the middle of nowhere, and I told my team the next morning, like, we went back to the hotel for a few hours, 
to recuperate. And I told him when they, we got when they got up, I said, "Hey, you guys are gonna have to help me find a ring because <laughs> I'm gonna propose at the end of this race." And my my team's like, "What? What are you talking about?" <laughs> and so we got a ring going through the one little town there. It's a really quaint little mountain town called Lone Pine. And uh, and Kelly had no idea. She thought the surprise was you know absolutely her coming out there. But then the big surprise was when she got to the. We got to the finish line. I proposed to her. It was a little hard getting down to the position <laughs> after the race, but uh, you know, it, it all came together, and and it was really beautiful. She she said yes, and we we were uh, you know so happy to have that moment. That Mount Mount Whitney is one of my favorite places on the whole planet. So yeah, I couldn't have ever asked for anything greater if I had planned that for years and years and years. <laughs> so. It all just came together so wonderfully. And I, so I love the spontaneity in it. Uh, and I loved just the whole experience. And it was something really special for us both that we'll always, you know, cherish that, that time together. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Crystal, I have a prediction. Harvey's, What's that? Harvey's going to be a ponytail grandpa someday, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> He's just going to be the cool, smooth ponytail grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that is a my goodness. So <laughs> that, you've talked about traveling well, you, all Vic. you've talked about traveling all over and I saw something and now this was at the end of 2016 so this may have changed since then but I saw that you had visited over 84 countries. W- what are you adding yeah, on maybe. for this year? Well, this year I added on uh Grenada which was was in December, and then I also went to Haiti last month. And, and, and both those countries really, you know, I, were far beyond my expectations. I, I, I was really amazed by the both. Grenada is a, a little hidden oasis that, that not as many Americans get to. It has just an amazing mountain, lush environment, and it's still a bit pristine there. Yeah, I've, you can I've get been off there. The it's beautiful. Track. And Haiti, it, it, it has, you know, it's, it has its history. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it, it, amazing history. You know, when you look at it, it was the second Republic after the United States, uh, to, to gain its independence and, uh, to abolish slavery, but also it's, it's challenges with poverty and in the, the, uh, turbulence of government. But the people I found there were just amazingly, uh, delightful and, and truly giving. And uh, they, despite the, the poverty, I, it, it's a place I would definitely go back to. But I typically like to incorporate some sort of running into these adventures I travel with. With Haiti, I, I ran uh, on this crazy, 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 crazy road. <laughs> it's uh, Route 1, Highway 1 in uh, Haiti. And I ran from Port-au-Prince with a fellow who I hired as my guide, David. He rode his bicycle. Uh, facing the traffic, I ran against the traffic, and we covered a hundred kilometers, which doesn't sound maybe to like an elite ultra runners is, is very much maybe, but on that type of road, it's a lot. <laughs> it's oh, a imagine. lot. It's it's really challenging with the the pollution is is really strong. Whenever you're in the populated spots, like just the air pollution is really rough and. You know, a lot of people don't realize like that impact, but I've, I've, I've experienced that in India and in China. And when you have that air pollution, it's, it's, it's more difficult to me to be in air pollution than it is to be on a 10, 10,000 foot mountain. Uh, it's, it's a different type of, of challenge and it causes your, your body to have to work extra hard. Um, it's hot. It was, it was, it was pretty phenomenal though. As we're going, you know, I had no, no, no protection. Like we, you know, people are very fearful. Like when they hear some of these places in the world, they're like, Oh my God, I would never go to Haiti. Oh, I, 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 weren't you afraid? Like what, someone's going to attack you or steal your stuff. You know, I ran, you know, I had my backpack and everything I owned in the backpack, my passport, all this stuff. Uh, no one bothered me one time the whole way. You know, it, it had people along the route, like, you know, giving me cheers and stuff like that. Uh, it was really nice, really something special. And we finished, uh, our adventure at this really amazing, uh, historic fort that was built back in the 18, early 1800s. And it's the largest of its kind that vintage in, uh, the Americas. 
and there were not many people there. <laughs> it was a beautiful, beautiful sight. And you, you, you get to those places, and you just find, like, there's only a sprinkling of people that, that go off to those spots, and they're just magical magical so yeah i have like a, a dream to it's it's even more pa- passionate i'm more passionate about the travel than than perhaps even the running and, and that's to, to go and explore all the countries on, in the world and i'm at 86 now uh right now i don't have anything uh i've got trips planned for the summer but they're countries i've already been to so but i'm always ready for something spontaneous to pop up <laughs> so Chris, so if you guys got any ideas, let me know. Hey, have you done Antarctica <laughs> yet? Because that's on my bucket list. Yes, yes, I, I did Antarctica. Uh, it was like a, a 30th birthday celebration. Okay. Uh, it, it was, I, I, what I loved about Antarctica the most was I could never have dreamed how much wildlife is there. I thought that, oh, it's Antarctica. It's going to be it, it's, you know, so cold, nothing could possibly live there or, or be there. And I was I was blown away that there's more life in Antarctica than there is in Ohio, like hmm. in terms of like the the warmer season. Yeah. So, I mean, hmm. just you'll go to places where you'll find millions of penguins, like literally millions of penguins. It's incredible. Hmm. And the birds, all kinds of like uh, whales and dolphins. I mean, it's it's a real you know, it still has that 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 virgin territory feel to it. Uh, although you're seeing more and more, uh, you know, groups and, and individuals going down there, which you could have some impacts on, on it, on the ecosystem. So you, you didn't find a nice little bar there, huh? Well, you know what? <laughs> there are a couple of interesting sites down there. You know, the Chileans, they have a little base that they, the British, uh, there's a, a couple of countries that claim it is their, their country, Argentina and Chile. Hmm. So you might be able to find a little bar down there. <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to, definitely. Well, well, Harvey, we had we uh, put out on our Facebook group that you were coming on for an interview, and we had some people that had some questions for you. Would you mind answering them? Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. All right. You want to read the first one, Miss Crystal? Yeah. So we had somebody who wanted to know, um, talking about bad water, um, and maybe you might be able to explain a little bit what bad water is for those who, who don't know. But um, the question always comes up, how do you train for the heat in the hills? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, the, the heat train is something I, I pride myself on. Bad water is next to the, I, I say this, the flying pig is my favorite race in the world. But next to the flying pig, it would be bad water. Bad water is just such an ex- special, special experience. I mean, I, I'm excited about going to Belfast, but but Badwater just has something that's a, a spiritual quest to it. I mean, going from the hottest place in the world to the highest point in the 48 states, it's just such an amazing, ex- exhilarating experience. So the heat training, uh, there's a couple of things. You know, some people, they, they want to train like with the heat every single day. And really, it's not necessary. Uh, to be honest with you, the most efficient that I found is just to to put yourself in heat training mode uh, a couple days a, a, a week, building up maybe uh, three months before the race. And then if you want to, you can add a few more days in that. Uh, but you don't really need to do it every day. Uh, the, there's a couple ways you can do it. The one, one, one great way is the sauna. And you can go to the sauna and just be very careful. You know, you don't want to die. <laughs> so you want to make sure, like, it's, it could be dangerous. You know, like, uh, heat's dangerous, you know, if you're not careful. So, I mean, it, it, it's a very serious thing. Like, every year, unfortunately, we have people that go out to Death Valley that are not part of our group. Because uh, uh, the, the Chris Kostman, who's the, the race director of Badwater, he is super serious. I mean, in fact, of all the races I've ever been to, I can't think of a single race where the race director treats uh, they race more seriously than Chris Costner. And he, he takes the race very seriously because there was one year where the race was put into total jeopardy, uh, where we had a different superintendent of national parks for Death Valley and they put the race, they barred the race for a year. So we are very serious collectively about the safety of the race. And, uh, you know, every year there's people that uh, are not part of the race, but they're just individuals out there on holiday. And even sometimes there's, a, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, there was a guy who was a French uh, marathon runner who, who is not with us. It was like before a month or so before we had done our race. And he just went out in the sand dunes and 
he got disoriented and he unfortunately didn't make it back. So, I mean, it's very important to take heat seriously. Uh, and I would say that first, but, uh, the sauna training is, is a great way. And the other thing I do is I'll throw on more clothing. So I'll go out and run in a hot part of the day and I'll put on like layers of clothing and I, you gradually build up to that. Uh, but you, you can do it with just like 45 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour is perfect. You don't have to go out and run for four hours to wear it, wear the winter suit. Yeah. Just that, that impact, it, it, it changes, it trains your body is physiology uh, to, it, it influences the body's physical response to, to heat stimulus so that your body is going to perspire more. It's going to react to like heat more. And then psychologically, it influences you because you psychologically become more adapted to like the heat. Now, the next question is... That might be a little too much of an answer for you. That, that's, a, that's a perfect <laughs> answer. I give you, I give you too much. I, I didn't give you the... the I, there, I even have worse material, man. <laughs> What's the bad material? <laughs> I got some bad material. I'll try to be a little little gentle, a little gentle. So, yes, go get it. Go get it. But you definitely need to be aware, you know, cautious of the heat. Like it, you know, it's something you don't just automatically you jump into the furnace. You know, you have to build your body up to that it, over a, a, a period of time. You know, Crystal, I think uh, tomorrow's Instagram is going to be a quote that just says, you don't want to die, <laughs> Harvey Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. Your training went I wrong. I think that may be my motto going in, into my next race. You know, so bad. You, you know your training went bad if you die. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Well, the, oh, the next question is, is kind of related, and the uh, the, the listener want to know, how can you run Badwater 135, climb Mount Whitney, and then run the Grand Canyon with a matter within a matter of days? Yeah, that, that was just a, a, one of those special moments in my life that, you know, you have, uh, as runners, we probably can look back and we can think about three or four moments maybe were really special in our running experience. And I mean, I have had so many amazing experiences, but that, that particular six day period was something that, 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 uh, was unparalleled. I, I finished Bad Water and I won the race. It was my dream, uh, going back, uh, to, since 2007 to run Bad Water. And when I first applied, I didn't get in the race. So it was even uh, more amazing when I got into the race in 2010 and I had my, my goal of winning the race and it took me, to 2014 to get to that goal, uh, that that was just a, an amazing experience. So I was on cloud nine, and uh, the idea of like working for something so hard. The previous two years, I had finished fourth place, and I had worked so hard. So the idea of actually winning the race was kind of like a, an out there dream. That I, it just when it really when it happened, I, I just it felt like uh, some sort of. Uh, it's sort of like a dream. You know, it's something that, that, that was, uh, not like, uh, fully materialized. It was amazing. So I, I was like cloud nine and I love coming to the top mountain. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, a group of runners every year, typically after they finish the race, they'll go back down to the bottom, get some food. And then the next day they wake up, uh, or the day after that, and then they'll climb Mount Whitney. And that is by far one of the most beautiful routes. And I would recommend it to anyone running the race is to climb Mount Whitney. So after that, and my friend Carlos Saw was there from Portugal, and he and his friends they wanted to go back to the Grand Canyon, and I had no idea I was going to climb or run the rim to rim to rim. Uh, but we got out there, and the plan was to go down to the bottom, and we got down to the bottom, and I said, you know, guys, uh, I really feel pretty good here, and I've always wanted to do <laughs> do this rim to rim to rim thing. So I think I'm just going to go. <laughs> and I'll find my way back. And uh, they're like, Harvey, uh, no, that's not a good idea. <laughs> you know? But uh, fortunately, Carlos, he's usually game for kind of crazy ideas, too. So he, he understood. And uh, that, that's, you know, it wasn't like uh, any time record on that. But it was a, certainly like a, a personal record, like of a, you know, just a phenomenal experience. And, and uh, you know, I, I had so much uh, positive energy from that experience. I felt like I could practically run home afterwards but yeah it was it was something magical and we have another genius quote too that we're going to use i'll find my way back <laughs> 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 I, 
I love that. I absolutely well, love his, that. His, his doctor made me uh, record this video that I that I did. That they had warned me not not to do this, but you know I, I had done my. <laughs> they were not responsible for me, you know, doing this crazy idea. <laughs> That's just awesome. Yeah, Pedro is a good friend of mine. Um, the next question, still kind of on that same same idea, um, in it's basically what was what is it like to train for the hottest, so for bad water and the coldest Arrowhead um, races on Earth, and then how do you prepare to go from one extreme environment to the other? Yeah, you know, I, I really uh, love the idea of, of pressing myself in new challenges. So you know, I, I've been ultra running for, believe it or not, it's hard to believe, but I did my first ultra at the Fans 24-Hour Race in 1996. So 21 years I've been running ultra running. Uh, and, you know, I always uh, like to, like, try to new areas to explore uh, new areas and to try to like push myself in, in new ways I haven't touched upon. So I had been doing the long or the hottest race in the world. And I thought, well, the arrowhead, it looks about like the antithesis of bad water the, in the comparison in the cold environment. So I thought that that would just be a really neat experience. And so I, I, I signed up for, it and, uh, I, I jumped in and, you know, that, that is, is a, a, a totally different brutal environment. So you could take someone who's, performing the the top uh in western states or in leadville or uh on the road ultra or any of these different ones and they may totally not be able to finish in the top in in a race like bad or bad water or arrowhead for that matter it's it's just a different type of environment the guy that actually won the year i did it i, I managed to come in second with uh Giannis, uh or Jan Cristo. Uh, we, we tied in that race, but the guy that finished ahead of us, uh, really amazing Swede, uh, he came to Badwater, uh, the last two years and he hasn't been able to, I think maybe crack the top 20 in Badwater, but he was so dominant in the arrowhead. So it's kind of interesting how people can have sort of different specializations that they excel in. And I, I like pressing and pushing myself uh, in different, different modes. This year, uh, this past year, I got the opportunity to, to experience some more, uh, even longer distance races, running in the Gobi Desert, doing a 400-kilometer race, and then also doing the MD, uh, MDS in Morocco, uh, which was a stage race. So it was a different environment, too. But it's, it's what's exciting about Austria. There's so many different things you can get into. <laughs> That's so true. Okay, our next question. We know you are a vegetarian, but do you know how many calories you consume on an average day? Well, that's a good question. You know, last, last summer I actually recorded my like consumption for like ten days, just because I was kind. I'm always kind of curious and, and like uh, want to understand things a little better. And uh, over that time period, I was consuming about thirty five hundred to four thousand calories a day. But if I'm doing a race like Badwater, like oh, and I'm drink, I'm eating, drinking a lot of calories. So I mean, it's 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 hard to say. But you have to ask my my uh, crew chief for Badwater because he keeps a real detailed like uh, analysis of everything. But it's uh, probably close to eight thousand calories. And how much of that's in Coca Cola? Yeah, a lot of Coca Cola. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love it. It's like it's Jeff Fuel. Uh, you know, it, it certainly is jet fuel. Uh, you know, I like variety too. Variety is king to me. So, you know, I'm in the 24 hour world championship race. You know, I, I will purposely have like access to like, I will create like 10 or, or 12 drink options for myself. And I, I like the variety because I find that after, uh, you know, four or five hours or something, you get kind of tired of it, even if you like it a lot, usually. <laughs> Yeah, except for the Coca Cola. <laughs> that, that, that's good all. That's good all the time. That that and grapes soda. But I don't. I don't drink those like you know, all the time. But when I'm in a race, yeah, <laughs> a lot of it. Yeah. Um, the next one, I'm I'm very curious about this one as well. How do you manage your time? And so it's how are you able to work full time, train full time, um, manage run quest travel? Which if you can talk about that a little bit too, because I'm really I'm personally very interested in that. Um, you also coach. How how do you fit all of that in? 
Well, you, I don't own a TV. That's one way. You know, I honestly, uh, it's it's really um, like multitasking. Like even now that we're on uh, on this podcast, I'm I'm even walking as we're on the podcast. I'm always finding ways to incorporate training. And uh, you know, a lot of people they only want to run if they have like an hour segment or a two hour segment. If I have a ten minute segment, get me out there. <laughs> Let's go. You know, it's, it's so. I mean, typically I'll like want to run at least two miles or more. Like that's all I have. That's all I have. And so you, you have to, you work with what you got. And, uh, so, you know, there are people that you know, are professional, like at runners or the people that might have like a little bit more lenient schedule or this and that. But uh, if you want it bad enough, uh, you go, you find it, you find a way to go get it. Uh, but you have to, you know, keep the balance with your, your friends and your family. And, uh, you know, that, that's so, so important. Uh, but, uh, the, the big way, one of my big ways that I've been able to do this is with run commuting. So I basically uh, run back and forth to school every day. And that is amazing because, uh, you know, I could be driving in my vehicle. I don't live that far away. It's only five K each way. Uh, but if I ran, if I run to work, I can actually run. If I'm running full speed and all out, I can run faster than I can drive my Jeep and park my Jeep in the garage and walk to the to the classroom. So I'm actually faster running. And sometimes I've even raced the bus. Like I've raced the bus from my like neighborhood right down to the city. And lady laughs so hard. But I beat the bus. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it happens. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it, that that's kind of a, you know, not everyone has that luxury if you have those. Maybe, you know, you got 30, 30 miles to cover or something like that. But finding little windows like that really helps a lot. And I, I, the big thing I would say is it not, not needing to have a giant block of time. You don't have to have two hours to train. You know, if you only have 30 minutes to train, go run for 30 minutes, go run 30 minutes again later in the day or something like that. So, you know, it's, that works really well, you know, uh, and, and that, you know, and make it fun. So I love training with other people. You know, I like having, uh, I like coaching runners. I coach, uh, running groups with, uh, the marathon, uh, with the, the store in town. And, uh, I also coach people independently, but I like running with people. It really, I find it much more motivating to be out there on a run with one of you guys, uh, than by myself. I mean, occasionally I like to run by myself for sure. You know, it's like the, that serenity and, and the meditation. And uh, all those nice qualities we find running alone. But I really like running with other people. So on any given week, I run with my students. I run with people I'm training. I run with, like, other athletes that are competing. I run with my neighbors. <laughs> I, run with, I run with a lot of people, you know. Uh, probably uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe the schedule of people I run with. I, I mean, it's probably it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of people. <laughs> if we add all the people together this week, you guys wouldn't believe it. One last question, and then I want to get into RunQuest travel. So our, our last question uh, from the listeners are, do you cross-train, practice yoga, or anything to stay loose? Well, you know, it, it, I would 100% recommend practicing yoga. I, and for me personally, like, uh, I only pretty much try to do about 10 minutes of yoga uh, whenever I can. And right now with the, the, like, the peak of training I'm getting into, I've been basically, you know, incorporating at least 10 minutes of yoga a day. And that, that's phenomenal because it helps you to reset your body because you're, you're pushing your body all the time. And the more that you, you find these things and walking, like what I'm doing right now with walking is so excellent for your body to recuperate. If you do a big giant race and you don't do any walking, uh, after that race, the next day you just like say, oh, I'm going to just take it easy, take it off. Your body will not recover. Uh, it'll recover twice as fast if you were to do the walking. You'll walk for 20, 30 minutes every day after the race. That's huge. And then cycling. So I push myself so hard in the running now, uh, training right now for the world championship, just going at 100%. I, I can, like, you know, put output, like almost 100%, you know, without, without injuring myself. So I, I will get on my bike and cycle once or twice in the week. Because it, it it's uh it's like economics, you know. You have like that law of diminishing return. So if you you get uh, to a point where you're you're not receiving as much return from running, you can get on a bike and you can get it's lower lower line fruit 
you get uh, a little bit more return for the bike by using the bike once or twice a week. It's kind of a nice way to loosen up your body too. And then the final thing is uh, not training per se, but it's, it's uh, you know, having someone that works with you on your uh, structural body. I mean, not everyone can afford to have like a, a massage therapist or something on that order, but you could do like hot baths with Epsom salts. I, I like these mineral salts I get from Whole Foods. You could use a roller, uh, which I'm not too good at, <laughs> but, or you could maybe find someone to work with you. I have amazing guy. His name is Andy Shetterly, and he's like really well known in Cincinnati. I call him Mr. Miyagi, and like the guy is phenomenal. Like, I mean, you'll press on my hip and I feel my toe. You know, it's like, uh, you know, if I'm having some sort of issue whatsoever, you know, he he'll work with me. You know, typically maybe I'll, if I'm in full training mode, maybe I'll try to get to see him like once a week, and uh, he he really makes an impact. It's it's phenomenal. So if you if you could see someone like that, if you if you, if you have the ability, like they can make a real impact in like helping you to prevent. You want to make sure your body is like uh, has symmetry from right to left. So you don't want to have like imbalance. If you have something bothering you, like your calf on one side, that can lead you to compensating with some sort of strange form, which can lead to an injury on your other side. So as much as possible, you want to have equilibrium. And rotate your shoes, you know, and, and also a, a plug, Newton, uh, Newton, I've been running with Newton since 2010, is another thing that's kept me healthy for all this time. Uh, the design of the shoes is such, the science behind the lugs that they have, so that you have perfect form. Uh, instead of, like, hitting the heel on your, your, uh, your stride, you land midsole and go off the front, and the shoes are and amazing. I mean, I, I I call them the Ferrari. They don't cost the Ferrari. They're not the cost of a Ferrari, but like to me, I, I love them so much. Like the design, uh, the science behind them. You know, I found it, that there's not that many runners. They're kind of like still like there's there's still a bit of a they're big in the the Iron Ironman world, uh, triathlon world, but there's not as many ultra runners that wear them. But uh, they they're phenomenal because you can. Uh, I, I feel like you have less risk of injury and it's more efficient for long, long distances, uh, because with, you're not having any stoppage by like, uh, the design. No, I, haven't amazing, I haven't but, tried Newton's yet, but I might have to order a pair because I've, I've heard some other people say some really good things about it. Yes. Yeah. It takes a few weeks, a couple weeks to adjust. When you first wear them, you'll feel like you're almost falling forward. Uh, but, uh, after that adjustment period, like, I think you'll you'll find that your your form will be the best and most efficient wearing Newtons. Guess I have to buy something else now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Add it to the list. That's a, we runners we we love uh, our toys, right? Oh, and shoes. If I get a new pair of shoes, like get a new car, it's like woo. Yeah, our our, our free excited. sport is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So tell me something about RunQuest travel. Yeah, Run RunQuest is just an exciting way to see the world. We have I have a, a partnership with my very good friend Carlos Saw in Portugal, and we take runners on these amazing holiday running trips and hiking trips. We always every year we have you know at least a couple people that hike every day uh, in the mix. So if someone has a partner or a spouse that's that's not a runner, it's that's no worries. Every year we've had spouses come along that, that walk every day. Uh, and, you know, we have all kinds of, we go to the highlighted, most amazing places in the country. So with Portugal, we go to Lisbon, we go to Porto, but we also go to the little villages that are off the beaten track. We go and see amazing Roman bridges. We actually run on the Roman bridges. They're like 2,000 years old. And Roman uh, roads where there's nobody out in the middle of the, the national park. And they even have wild horses that, like, just naturally live out there. And we see them every year on the trail. It's amazing. Like, there's no fences or anything like that. They're just out there running, too. And uh, it, it's the culture in uh, Portugal and the food. <laughs> the food that, that, that we go for eight days. And that is the best eight days of the year that I eat, period. Like. And we, we have all kinds of food. So it's not like we just cater to vegetarians or vegans, you know, uh, everybody. 
it's it's an absolutely amazing place, and so it's it's particularly nice for people that you know maybe they they have a a, a real curiosity of going to the country, and they want to see the 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 most amazing places uh, with the limited time they have, and they don't want to you know they they don't, don't want to waste time you know with places that wouldn't be the most amazing place. So it takes that, and then we all we have uh, we always have. Uh, at least two bilingual Portuguese guides each day. And the ratio of guides to, to guests is really small. So we usually have like uh, about three or four guests per one guy. So it's a very high quality trip as well. It, it's just a really wonderful way to experience the world. I, I, I've, like I said, I've been doing a lot of running and traveling for the years, over the years, and I, and I have the, the teaching career. But I have my summers more flexible, and so I thought, you know, this would be just a wonderful way, you know, for people to expose them to like this magical world out there, uh, to take them to like the best places to see in Portugal and Spain, and you know, I, having great people along the route with Carlos Saw. Carlos Saw is pretty much like a national celebrity over there. It's kind of, kind of crazy. Uh, he's he's uh, he he's got a very interesting story. He actually was uh, over 200 pounds. He smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. He was working in the textile industry, and he got laid off in that. And he got into running, and he became actually a professional runner. And he does events over there. He has races. But you cannot get on a plane to Portugal and probably talk to, if you talk to you know four people, more than likely one or half the people will know who Carlos Saw is. So he, he's he's pretty well known in Portugal. So we get like special treatment. And the Portuguese are so hospitable, but they 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 uh, they give us a, a really special treatment over there. And he knows all the the neatest restaurants to experience. We stay in like charming hotels that are like really quaint and uh, beautiful places, not like a Holiday Inn. Uh, you know, it's all all like cultural we go and do wine and cheese tastings we visit you know uh castles and forts and all kinds of different things uh we do the el camino de santiago we experience the pilgrimage routes so there's there's different adventures planned every day and people can either you know jump into the day's adventure or they can also like if they want one day or two days or whatever to go and do something on their own for a side at it's everything is, is catered around each person. Wow, so it's amazing. entirely flexible. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful way to see, see the world. Now, is there a website people can visit to learn more? Yes, we actually have uh, runquesttravel.com. So we have a website they can visit and you can see the itinerary. Uh, we're, we're looking to add another trip next year to another locale, which we'll hope to announce uh, in, in August or September. But Portugal is, uh, we've kind of developed a special relationship with Portugal and we'll continue. This is our fourth year going there. We'll plan to go on there forever. <laughs> so we'll keep on going to Portugal. It's kind of become like a second home. And it's funny because, you know, I'm on Facebook, it's, it's been nice to have, you know, a, a pretty good, uh, following and network of folks, uh, who follow our adventures. And to be honest with you, I think, uh, the second largest collection after my my hometown of Cincinnati is Portugal. Mm-hmm. So, like a lot, I know a lot of Portuguese runners, and they are so friendly and hospitable to me. And you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a, a wild experience. But like, you know, it, it's not it, it's not uncommon that I'll just be running through Lisbon or Porto, and they'll say, "Hey, Harvey, how are you doing?" <laughs> you know, it's like it it sounds crazy, but it's so true. You know, I've had friends that have been in different races, like in Chicago or different places. And they, they, they said, well, my friends, Kevin said, oh, I was with this guy. And he, he's like, uh, he's talking, I, I could tell he had an accent. I said, where are you from? He said, oh, I'm from Portugal. And he said, oh, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from like Cincinnati. He said, oh, you know, Harvey Lewis. <laughs> so, it's, kind of fun. it's kind of funny. It's, it's a real small world, but like Portugal is like a second home to me. And I love the Portuguese people. They are so so friendly. They always give me so much positive encouragement. Uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's a special experience. 
Oh, that's amazing. Well, Harvey, we're getting a little long here, so we want to uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. If listeners want to follow your uh, your adventures, are there social outlets they can subscribe to, Instagram or Facebook? or? Yes, the best place to follow is uh, I have an athlete page on Facebook, Harvey Lewis Ultra Runner. Okay. And also on Instagram, we have Run Quest Travel, our two good good spots to follow and we will put enjoying links. the adventures ahead <laughs> yes let's <laughs> we'll see what what comes with belfast and badwater both less than 10 days apart as well which would be another aspect of the challenge this year <laughs> it's just crazy <laughs> but i respect it <laughs> we will have links to all of the social sites and run quest travel in the show notes for this episode For those of you that are looking for something to do on June 10th, the entire Heartland running crew will be out at Rutz in Paducah, Kentucky, taking a leisurely 10-hour stroll around a half-mile horse track. So you can come out, meet Crystal, Andy, and I. Be sure to say hi. Uh, We'd like to encourage everyone to join our Facebook group. You can just search for Heartland Running. Join the social group. Don't worry about the the business page, the social groups where where it's at. You have to ask to join, but I assure you someone will approve you. And if you'd like, you can call our voicemail at area code 417-319-1060 and leave us a message and you might even hear it played on the air. Well, once again, we'd like to thank everyone for sticking us in your ears. And until next time, I'm Stephen. And I'm Crystal. And we'll talk to you soon.